we're here down to uh, chapter 8, dimensionality reduction. So here's the slides that go with this. And I thought this was very interesting. That's why I'm, I'm several weeks ahead in this class because I'm racing ahead. This stuff is fascinating because I'm sure I've mentioned to you before, I did incredibly early versions of this many decades ago. And I'm fascinated to see how it grew up and became useful. So we're going to talk about the problem with dimensionality, which is very entertaining mathematics, very simple mathematics, and then how you achieve dimensionality reduction, the most popular version being PCA, Principal Component Analysis. And as before, random projection. We've many times talked about how purely random models work pretty well. And um, all right. So we'll talk about these things. OK. All right, so high dimensionality is the problem these days. Nowadays, cameras have ridiculous resolution, like 24 megapixels. So that means an iPhone image has 24 million pixels, each with three colors. So if your data, if you're trying to do something like a self-driving car, it's got LiDAR sensors, it's got a GPS, it's got a front camera, a long-range radar. Uh, it's a 3D image capture, so it must be a pair of cameras a driver monitoring camera, road moisture, internal microphones, all that data is coming in. That's a lot of dimensions. The images themselves are millions of pixels. So you do have machine learning models working on data in a ridiculously high number of dimensions. And as we're going to see, that is really hard. And by the way, the same thing is true of the human visual system. I don't know if I managed to put any biological slides in here, but it's the first thing I thought of because I used to work on this stuff. Um, your eye has a whole bunch of neurons, uh, pick, uh, sensors picking up colors, and that's feeding in a similar vast amount of data, and you can't possibly process all that data, so you have special parts of your brain, I think it's the amygdala, designed to remove 99% of the data and focus on some small part of it as being important and only pay attention to that small part. And that is what you have to do. You have to somehow throw away all the unimportant data and keep only the useful data. All those millions of parameters can't possibly be important. If they are, your job is so vastly complicated, you're never going to be able to afford any processor that can actually do it. So there's two methods, projection and manifold learning, and three popular techniques. Principal component analysis is by far the most popular than random prediction and local linear embedding we're going to talk about here. So first thing you can do is a little calculation to see why this is bad. And this is pretty simple. So consider a one by one square. Mo if you just pick random points, most of the points are in the middle, not close to the edge. But how about a hypercube with many dimensions? It turns out most of the points are near an edge. And when I first read that, it was hard to understand. And then I realized it's actually quite easy to, um, to prove that, which we'll do in a minute. But anyway, here's another issue. If you want to fit a curve like this, you need to have enough points to really trace out the wobbles in the curve. So you need fairly dense samples. The data can't be too sparse. If all the data were just at the left and the right end, you wouldn't have any of this detail in the middle. And you need that. So if all your points are near the edge, then you can't really trace out this, the shape here. And how many points are near an edge? Here's the problem. You have many um, parameters. So if I have various dimensions, 2, 3, 10, 30, up to like 10,000 dimensions, you can calculate how many of those points are near the edge. And the point is, if I have 10,000 dimensions and I pick a random point, I pick 10,000 random numbers from 0 to 1. And of course, some of those numbers are going to be near 0 and near 1. So it's going to be near one edge. A oh, refreshing twitch. Oh, glad to hear it. Anyway, so that's the point. So you can see here how many edge points out of 1,000 um, are near the edge. And I define an edge as being uh, less than 0 0.01. So I didn't even consider the ones greater than 0.99 as an axis. These are ones near the 0 point. And the point is, once you get up to 100 dimensions, more than half the points are near the edge. And once you get up to 1,000 dimensions, essentially all the points are near an edge, which makes sense because you've drawn 1,000 random numbers. And you're asking, is even one of them less than 0 0.01? And of course, that will almost always be true. And that means at least one of those points is very near an edge. 
And now, another thing is you can decide how far apart the far they are. If you consider a 1 by 1 hi hypercube, its volume is 1 to the d. Now, how much of the volume is not near an edge? You can do the same calculation in two dimensions. 96% of it, the volume is, of the area is in the middle. And you can see it. The black area is near the edge. The green area is not near the edge. Most of it's near the edge. But the same thing happens um, if you consider 0.98 as the area not near an edge, then the volume of the inside part is 0.98 to the d, where the d is the number of dimensions, and that rapidly gets small. At 100 dimensions, only 13% of the volume is not in an edge, and once you get up to 1,000 dimensions, it's ridiculous. Essentially, zero of the volume is not near an edge. It's another way to look at it. Then you can consider the distance between two random points. Now here, um, here's the average distance between random points. In two dimensions, they're 0.5 apart, as you might imagine. In three dimensions, it's about the same. But as the dimensionality goes up, the points get further and further and further apart. So you don't, even if you have a lot of points, you're not going to have dense tracing of anything else because the average points are 400 units apart in all those dimensions. And so that means you've got a serious problem. Um, and you can calculate it approximately this way by just saying there are about 0.5 in each dimension, but that's going to be um, n dimensions. 0.5 squared times n is going to rise to a really big value. And so what that means is even if you have a lot of data in a high number of dimensions, that data is sparse. It doesn't trace out a curve like this. It's like you had just one or two points in this curve. It's not enough data to really reflect the trend of the even if you have millions of data points. That's the problem. So this means you're very likely to overfit. You're not really going to have enough data to define the trend. You're just going to fit the points you have that are pretty much random. So you're not going to get a good model. And so that's a problem. Um, here's another, another way to look at it. If you have a 100-dimensional hypercube from 0 to 1, and you decide, I would like to have at least 10 points across this, point 0.1. I'd like to have points at 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. Then how many hypercubes are there, 0 0.1 on a side? Well, there's 10 in this dimension and 10 in every other dimension, so there are 10 to the 100 hypercubes. So it would take 10 to the 100 samples to get even 10 points across each dimension. So there's no way you could ever have that amount of data. As we talk about in the cryptography class, even 2 to the 100 is an impossible number. You can't ever do that many cal processing calculations on anything. You can't store that much data. That's, that's crazy. So you cannot possibly have enough evidence to actually trace out 100 dimensions of data and do any processing on it. So whatever problem you're trying to solve, it cannot possibly be that complex or you will never solve it. So you're fooling yourself. All that high dimensionality data is not really necessary, which, like I say, is what your human brain has evolved to do the same thing. Your human brain has figured out, I don't really need to process all the light intensity from every pixel. I just need to zero in on the important stuff, and then I can decide if there is a rock coming at my head or something important around, like some food I want to pick up. There's, there's a, I've learned how to pick out the important things and throw away all the irrelevant data. So that, that, yeah, I did have a picture. Here's human vision showing how it works. Goes through a couple of brain structures to do exactly the same thing, to define something called attention, and only pass data relevant to the thing you're paying attention to, and discard all the peripheral data. All right, so you got to do dimensionality reduction. It's a fundamental problem that must be solved for any of these high dimension problems. So here's one way to do it. Um, one way is to just project everything down to a lower dimensional structure. Like if you're in three dimensions, you can project down to a two dimensional plane here by just drawing a plane to pass through the points and then remove the distance off the plane and just move them perpendicularly onto the surface of the plane. So the red dots are moved down to the blue dots. That's called projection. Um, yeah, attention. Well, attention is an essential part of what you need. And this, by the way, explains a lot of things, like, you know, the, um, the famous demonstrations that human witness, eyewitness testimony is terrible, like the one where you watch a video and there's something like ridiculous, like a guy in a gorilla suit riding a bicycle through the video, and you don't even see it because you're paying attention to the ball. That's, that's the cost of this, of course. By throwing away the data you think is not important, if you're wrong in your estimate of what's important, then you miss something. 
So after production, your 3D is reduced to 2D. All right. Um, all right, so then the other thing is manifold learning. If you have something like this, they call a Swiss roll, I think after Swiss candy or something. So you take something that was originally planar and you roll it around in three dimensions. Now, if you were to project it, then you would not really separate things very well. Like the yellow would be mixed into the dark brown and the orange. Like you see, if you project this just onto the bottom or really onto a plane anywhere, it's going to mix them up because the actual shape is curved in three dimensions. So, um, what you do is manifold learning is where you follow the shape, even the curved shape, and unfold it. Then you'll get this lower dimensionality projection as long as you can unfold it. All right, that's manifold learning. So consider the MNIST data. Um, we've used this before. You have 28 by 28 pixel grayscale images, and you're tracing out these things, and we want to sort them into categories to see what digits there are. Um, there are 784 dimensions. But the 700, you don't really need 784 dimensions, of course, <coughs> to sort this stuff into 10 categories. So um, it can be lowered, and we'll play with that. So here, you can make a decision boundary. Now here, what they've done is take something with a nice simple pattern and roll it up. So in 3D, the dark and the light colors are all mixed up. But if you unfold it, there really is just a line separating them. All right. So here, a decision boundary that is simple in 3D, if you make a three-dimensional grading and cut it here, it's simple in 3D, but in 2D it becomes more complex when you project it down. Or indeed, if you, even if you follow it along. So reducing dimensionality speeds up training because your calculations get simpler, but might, might not lead to a better or simpler solution. It's not always an improvement. All right, so anyway, let's talk about the main one, um, principal component analysis. This is what you do, and one thing about this is you do not need labels on the data. This is an unsupervised learning technique. So you have data like this in two dimensions, and you want to lower it to one dimension. What you do is you find the hyperplane that lies closest to the data, and then you project the data onto it. So that's simple enough. So if you projected the data onto a plane like this, a line like this, then you'd have almost no variation because your line is is causing most of the data to be discarded. And this line here is also not very good. But this line that cuts right through the data, that actually captures most of the significant variation in the data. Hyperplane synonymous of a subspace. Yes, that's right. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, so you find a the lower dimensional object um, in general. Yeah. So what you do is you can tell which one to use by seeing how much variation you have captured. Here, you have lost most of the variation. Here, you have captured most of the variation. That's why you don't need labels. You simply find the principal component, which is the component that preserves most of the variation in the data. So uh, equivalently, you minimize the mean squared distance from the samples in the plane. You minimize the off-axis variation, which is the same thing as maximizing the on-axis variation. And that is a simple mathematical problem that does not require labels. So you use the plane that preserves the most variance for C1. And then you find another axis, C2, which will capture most of the remaining variance. And on you go. That's why you, you can have as many dimensions as you want um, in your principal component analysis. And uh, there's a mathematical process called singular value decomposition, which does this. It's the mathematical operation that will find the unit vectors that define the principal components of, a, of an array. And so you can define it as the explained variance ratio, which is the proportion of the variance that lies along each component. So now you can decide when to stop, right? Because you can use enough dimensions to capture enough of the variance. You can decide, I want to capture just 95% of the variance. And I don't know how many dimensions that will take. That's one way to go. Another way to go is to reduce to two or three dimensions, because then you can visualize the data. Uh, those are different purposes. So as you increase the number of dimensions, of course, you explain more and more of the variance. And so it's not obvious where to, where to choose. Um, you can try to find the point of diminishing returns, which they call an elbow. You might be able to define that. Um, but it's kind of vague definition. All right. So you can treat the number of dimensions as a hyperparameter and then perform a randomized search to find good values for all these together, just like we've done before. Um, so 
And here's what I mentioned before. You can use this for compression, if you think about it. If you apply it to the MNIST data set with 784 dimensions, and you capture 95% of the variance, it only needs 154 dimensions to do that. So that has compressed the data to less than 20% of its original size. You take 784 down to 150. You can then decompress this back to 784 dimensions to see the picture, and you can see the reconstruction error. So here's the original data, and here's what happened with this compression scheme that only preserved 95% of the data. And as you can see, it's blurred out this 9 a little bit and added a little background noise, but you can judge the quality. So you can regard principal component analysis as a, pre as a compression scheme. All right. And you can also do randomized principal component analysis. If you have too many points and too many dimensions, and it's too difficult to actually find the principal components, you can use a stochastic algorithm to find an approximation. Um, and that's what Scikit will automatically use. And I think this just chooses a small subset of the data or, or, uh, or dimensions to use to get a vague idea of where to draw the lines without bothering to draw them very precisely. And then there's incremental PCA, which is where you break it into mini batches and feed them in one at a time because your number of instances is too large and you can't fit them all in memory at the same time. So those are the variations. So let's try a Kahoot. All right, 8A. Yeah, and, and I see uh, the, Im the comment about uh, image compression. Uh, this should be compared to JPEG, because ping and TIFF are lossless compressions. But this is lossy compression, JPEG. As you can see, it doesn't really preserve 100% of the original information. You throw some of it away. song. How many points are near the edge of a thousand dimension hypercube? Right, almost all of them are near the edge. So what technique is best when you have high dimensionality data? All right, you've got to reduce its dimensionality. You can't possibly get enough data. All the data in the world would never be enough for even 100 dimensions. And you know, these other techniques are not going to um, solve it either. So you have to reduce the dimensionality. All right, what techniques lowers dimensionality by including only the distance along a hyperplane? That's projection. Good. All right. So, uh, random projection. 
We talked about this before. It's surprising how far you can get with just random techniques. You use a random linear projection to a lower dimensional space. Distances are still likely to be preserved. Things that are close will remain close. Things that are far apart will remain far apart. No training is required at all, and the data is not used at all to choose the projection axes. Um, this is, I think, responding to the general situation. You know if you have like a three-dimensional object, like bubbles in glass, you can just hold it up and look at it and see what bubbles are near and far, and it doesn't really matter how you turn it. You'll still see general information. Um, so one thing about this, of course, is if you project it down to D dimensions, um, you can calculate how many dimensions it's going to take for a certain tolerance, I think assuming some sort of uh, standard variation. Anyway, with 5,000 instances, 20,000 features, and 10% tolerance of losing distance information, you can get it down to 7,300 dimensions. So instead of uh, 20,000. That's a, how much you'd expect from random projection. And then there is another issue called sparse random projection. If you want to make your calculations even faster, you can choose to project it down to axes that go along some of the axes. So most cells are zero. This is one way to save a lot of calculation. You carefully use sparse matrices where most of the cells are zero. All right. Then there is locally linear embedding which is the one I talked about before that will follow the curves. This is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction. What you do is you compare, I'm missing a letter there, All right. you compare each instance to its nearest neighbors, and you look for a low dimensional representation locally, and then you follow the curve. So you do basically a linear fit only for a small region and another linear fit, and you follow it, so it'll follow along a twisted manifold. So they have this rolled up data, the LLE, will turn it into something like this. Whereas you can see there is some distortion, but it does follow the curve so all the dark ones stay together and all the light ones stay together. So now it's only going to take some simple uh, decision boundaries to sort this stuff into categories. And your long range distances are not preserved, but the short range distances are preserved. All right, there's other techniques like multidimensional scaling. Um, which preserves distances between the instances. Uh, and then there's isomap, which creates a graph connecting each instance to its nearest neighbors. So it tries to protect the, preserve the geodesic distances, which is the number of nodes on the shortest path. So this reminds me of graph theory, where they talk about structures, and it doesn't matter how they're distorted. What matters is how they, the nodes are connected to each other. So this is one way to sort of unfold something. Uh, make, and then there's this t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which tries to keep similar distances close and dissimilar instances apart, used for visualization. And then there's linear discriminant analysis, which learns the most discriminative axis between the classes, and they define the hyperplane. So this projection will keep the classes as far apart as possible. So those are general uh, information about them. And here's some examples of how they look. Uh, this is the multidimensional scaling. Takes that curve and turns it into this. Here's the ISO map, which seems to be the most perfect at keeping it organized the way it really would be if you unfolded it. Yeah, maps use geodesic distances. And t SNE is the one I think we used the geodesic distance. No, that was this one. It was linear discriminant. Let's see. No, it was isomap that used the geodesic distance. So that was this one, which seems like the most successful. And here's that t SNE, which is trying to keep similar distances close and dissimilar instances apart. And you see it has all of these have unfolded to some extent, but the isomap seems to have done the nicest job of really unfolding and making the decision boundaries real simple. So. These are ways to do it. And if you think about things like the Mercator projection, uh, maps of Earth, where you try to map a sphere down to a plane, there are similar issues. How do you do it? There are various ways to, uh, to unfold a sphere into a lower dimensions. And it's always subject to some degree of distortion. So there's another Kahoot here.
Yeah, you don't preserve the angles, just the geodesic distance. I think that's right. Yeah. Yes. Mercator doesn't preserve area either, which means like Greenland is, I think, smaller than Texas, but it looks much bigger, something like that. You know, it's... This is it. All right, so which one has the geodesic distances? Yeah, the map, ISO map. Okay. Which one uses arrays that are mostly zero? Sparse random projection, where you choose random axes, but you choose them to follow along quite a few of the axes to make the math simpler. All right, what techniques unrolls twisted manifolds? All right, that's LLE, which is locally linear. And I'm not sure what the third word is, so let me go back and look. Um, yeah, locally linear embedding is the one that follows this curve and uh, keeps the local distances preserved, although not long-range distances. All right. All right. And whoops. And ant ignore. All right. I've got those recorded. I'm going to stop the recording if I can find the right window. There we go.